I've been playing around with my RC2014 for a few weeks now, and pretty quickly I got to the point where the limitations of 32K basic and the bother of not having any way to persist files on the device started to stack up, so changes had to be made. Now you're never short of options when it comes to the RC2014, and I had a look around at different things I could do with it, and I decided to go for the original CPM upgrade kit from the RC2014 website. And after making that decision, I bought the upgrade kit from the Z80 kit site, Links to all of these in the description. And at the time of recording, stock for the update is pretty limited. By the time you're watching this, that might have changed. The reason I'm making this video is that the instructions that came with the kit were, well, invisible really, and there's not much on YouTube about it. There are plenty of videos on updating the RC2014 Pro, but not the Classic 2. And the Classic 2 update is done just slightly differently. So while I was assembling the kit, I emailed Spencer Owen, who designed and sells the RC2014. And as usual, I got a quick reply to my questions. He emailed me a link to a document on the website that, while not being a set of build instructions, were all that I needed to complete the kit. Well, after applying a bit of common sense. It has been noted and visible elsewhere on my uh, channel that I'm not exactly a skilled electronic technician. In fact, warning sirens go off in my village whenever I get the soldering iron out and people run in panic. However, it has to be said that this was an easy and fun build that worked first time. Before we get cracking, there's an important thing to bear in mind that this is an upgrade kit. It's not modules, so we're going to have to cannibalize some components from the original RC2014 Classic as we go along. But for ease of doing this, they're all actually socketed, which is brilliant. Right, so what's in the box? The kit comes well packaged in a suitably sized box. Unpacking the box, we see three kits, a compact flash card, and a bag of chips. And I'm pretty sure there's a cheese and onion joke hiding in plain sight somewhere, but I'm going to let that one go. So the three modules that make up the kit are the ROM module, which upgrades the base functionality with support for multiple page sizes, and that allow ROM to be mapped into different memory addresses. The RAM module, it extends the amount of available memory from 32K to 64K, and that allows memory to be mapped into different areas. And finally, the compact flash module that provides multiple drives for CPM use. In my case, I bought the 128 megabyte card, and that gives me 16 drives from A to P, each eight megabytes in size. Each disc is much bigger than a physical floppy was, but not gigantic. However, bear in mind that CPM 2.2 does not support folders other than the quite crude user number concept. These sizes are more than big enough. And I'm gonna cover CPM, users, and other stuff in a future video. The order of construction of these kits is completely independent and the order is up to you. In terms of relative complexity, I'd rank the three modules from most complex to least as pageable ROM, followed by the 64K RAM, followed by the compact flash module. Mind you, if that compact flash connector hadn't come pre-soldered, the order would be totally different. And I actually tackled the build in that order. And knowing what I do now, I might have built the CF module first as a kind of a warm-up exercise. The build time wasn't long, but I took my time and enjoyed the journey. I mean, joking aside, I do really enjoy soldering. And while you use the kit many times, you only get to construct it once. So you should save the process. Opening the packaging of the, the ROM module, and it's in a lovely old sweetie packet style, we get one mystery jumper cable, more on that later, one circuit board, five capacitors, five resistors, six dip sockets, a backplane connector, and lots and lots of edge connectors and headers. Now, one aspect of the design of the RC2014 that I particularly appreciate is the low component count, and that there are rarely multiple passive components of the same type with different values. So in this particular module, all the resistors and capacitors are of the same value. So you don't need a multimeter to work out which ones are which. So to complete the build, you're gonna to need to cannibalize the original Classic 2 board and extract the 74LS32 chip and all of the jumpers for reuse. So I made a, an executive decision and I decided to add a zero insertion force socket for the ROM rather than use the dip socket provided. There are alternative ROMs available for the RC, and I might want to go back to the original and possibly someday. So this just gives me an easier way to swap out ROMs. The build order was the usual smallest components to largest. So resistors, capacitors, sockets, headers, and the backplane connector. And then finally the ZIF socket. As usual, when socketing chips, make sure that they're pointing in the right direction. And I, the only thing I would note is there's little cares needed when you're trimming the header pins into different sizes that you trim from the right set of headers. I mean, it's kind of obvious, but this is a measure twice, cut once situation. When you look at the completed board, you'll notice that the zip socket is back to front. And this is necessary because the lever would otherwise be obstructed by the onboard chips if it was installed the correct way around. 
one thing I would say is that the model of Ziff socket that I bought doesn't have a latch in the down position. So unfortunately, this means it's kind of easy to release it accidentally when brushing past it. This is not anything to do with the kit. The kit is brilliant. I bought the socket. Just the modern ones don't seem to be as good as the old ones. Now we need to look at what the jumper settings should be for this board. So the document that Spencer provided from the RC2014 website, again, links in the description, the necessary jumpers are for page size, which is the bottom left set of jumpers. It's bottom, bottom, top, top, top. And that sets the page size to 8K. For page selection, which is on the middle-ish, right-ish part of the board, we don't connect the first, second, and third jumpers, and then we connect bottom, bottom, top. This sets the 8K page size to map into memory at hex 8000. So next, we move on to the RAM module. And the supplied components for this are circuit board, three capacitors, five dip sockets, a backplane connector, some edge connectors, and headers. Before building, we want to go and scrounge the required components out of the Classic 2 RAM board. And namely, we want the 6225 RAM chip and the 274LS32 chips. In other words, strip that board bare. Now, I have to say, extracting those chips wasn't the easiest process. They're positioned in the board really closely. I couldn't get my trusty chip puller into place. So I had to resort to using a pair of tweezers and sliding the blade of the tweezers underneath and gently easing out the two smaller chips. Once the RAM chips were out, I went back to the old chip puller and it worked fine. Board completed, we need to look at jumper settings and using the same PDF as before to configure the jumpers. All four jumpers are set to the right hand side of the three pins. The silk screen on the board didn't make a lot of sense until I read that the top three jumpers set the start address to zero and the bottom jumper has a totally different function that sets the lower 32K to be paged in or out from the pageable ROM board. Okay, final board and the easiest board construct. The CF Flash hard drive module comes with one circuit board, four 1K ohm resistors, one 330 ohm resistor, three capacitors, three dip sockets, one LED and a backplane connector. As I said, this is the easiest of the builds. When I was talking earlier about multiple passive components with different values, this is the only place in the entire session where this happens. If you look at the silk screen, all four of the 1K resistors go in the same bank. And since they arrived taped together, it's impossible to get that wrong. I appreciate that. Now there are no donor parts, no jumpers to set, so build and setup is a breeze. And I'm really just grateful that that compact flash card came pre-soldered, because my eyes would not allow me to solder that, and neither would my shaky hands. So the only possible thing that can go wrong other than solder shorts or failing to solder some pins is to get the LED in the wrong way around. So remember, long leg positive, short leg negative. That's our build complete, and we need to get the boards into the RC2014 and use the mystery cable. Well, it's not much of a mystery. I'm just being a tease. The RC2014 Classic comes with an 8-slot 40-pin backplane. There's also a Pro backplane that comes with 12 slots, each with a second smaller row of headers that form an enhanced bus with extra signals. That row of headers in our module, above the backplane headers, is where the extended bus pins will be soldered. The cable provided is used to connect pin 4 of the extended bus on the ROM card to pin 4 of the extended bus on the RAM card. This allows the ROM card to use the Reset2 line to page the lower 32K of RAM in when the ROM is paged out and vice versa. Mystery solved. So having removed two cards from the RC2014 to cannibalize parts from, we need to add their replacements back into the backplane and add the compact flash card. The cable that connects the extended header pins has solid plastic ends that make putting the ROM and the RAM cards into consecutive backplane slots feel a little tight and sort of uncomfortable. I didn't want to put stress on the boards. So since I have plenty of slots free, I went with the CF card in slot 8, the RAM in slot 5, left slot 4 empty, and then put the ROM card into slot 2. This leaves plenty of room around the ROM and RAM cards to play with the jumpers if I need to, and it gives me easy access to the CF card slot and the ZIF sockets for ROMs. Beautiful. Let's boot into CPM. After pressing the reset switch on the RC2014, you see the message space to activate console and it appears twice for some reason. So we hit the space and then typing a question mark gives us a list of options. Press X to boot into CPM and Y to confirm. And there we are, cooking with gas. On the A drive is a single file download.com which is used to, well, download stuff. And we'll cover that in a little bit. The C drive contains the CPM external OS commands. So like DOS, common operations like rename and deleting files are built into the shell. The less commonly used commands are actually standalone executables. And in our case, they're contained on the C drive. And at the risk of repeating myself again, there's a CPM video in the works as a follow-up. So I'm not going to cover any of those CPM commands here. So when I talked about the compact flash card, I mentioned it came with drives A through P. 
And here I'm just confirming that I can access those drives and that I can't access drive Q. So the download program in the A drive is how you get files into your RC 2014 CPM system. The way the download app works is that you encode binary files into an ASCII representation and paste that into the terminal. There's a page on the RC2014 website that allows you to encode a file and produce a sort of script that will run the download program and feed it data. Then it converts the data in its input stream from ASCII back to a binary file on the disk. So as an example, let's download the executable for Zork 2. So in the web form that Spencer provides, there are various options, all of which I'm going to leave at their defaults and just select my Zork2.com as the file I want to convert. When we press convert file, we get the ASCII representation. Now, if you notice, the first line is calling the download command on the A drive, and it tells it the name of the file to create. The second line tells download to save zork.talk2.com as user zero, and following that are the lines of ASCII encoded binary data. When you click the text, the web page will automatically select it for you, so it's just Apple C or Control C, copy it to the clipboard. Now, I'm going to contradict myself from a previous video. When I was transferring pasted code from my Mac to the RC2014, I used the screen command that worked absolutely fine. However, for download.com, it doesn't. It swamps the serial line with too much data and the download just fails. So in this video, I'm going to be using Minicom. Before we start the download, I need to add a millisecond delay between the keystrokes to prevent download from getting swamped. So it's, in other words, when we paste the text, it's going to type more slowly. So to do this, I hit Escape Z to get into the Minicom menu, T to enter the terminal settings menu, then press F to change the character transmit delay, and then set the value of that to one millisecond. Then I hit enter and that takes us back out. So now we paste the text from the website and it types the data in and produces the binary file, which took in this case about 27 seconds. Downloading the much larger DAT file took 258 seconds, which is about right because it's about 10 times larger. And the other thing that I didn't highlight in the video is that the ASCII representation of the file contains the length of the original file at the end. So if issues occur during transfer, download can warn you that the file size is incorrect. Okay, let's see our files on the disk and run Zork 2. You're inside an ancient barrow, hidden deep within the dark forest. The barrow opens into a narrow tunnel at its southern end. You can see a faint glow at the far end. A sword of elvish workmanship is on the ground. A strangely familiar brass lantern is lying on the ground. You are standing at the southern end of a narrow tunnel where it opens into a wide cavern. The cavern is dimly illuminated by the phosphorescent mosses clinging to its high ceiling, and a deep ravine winds through the cavern with a small stream at the bottom. The walls of the ravine are steep and crumbly. A footbridge crosses the ravine to the south.